Hello and welcome to this Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcast. I'm your host, Lena Rosen, the online editor for Bioprocess International. Before we get started, just a couple of notes. This webcast is being recorded and will be made available for replay in the multimedia section of our website. We've muted the audio lines, but we welcome you to type in your questions for our speaker in the question answer window on your screen. After the presentation, we will begin the question answer portion and I will ask our speaker your questions. Your questions in the question answer window will only be visible to myself and our speaker. So thank you for joining us today. It is now my pleasure to introduce our speaker, Ari Ojanaka from Australia Bioseparations. Thank you very much. Um, just like introduce, um, my name is uh, Ari Ojanaka. Hello everyone. Um, I'm production manager at Australia Bioseparations, and today I will be speaking about our manufacturing capacity and supply chain resilience. Um, first, I'd like to use the next few slides to just talk about who we are um, and what we do in terms of our, what we offer for products. Um, Astria is, was established over 30 years ago, and we offer an extensive range of bioseparations products. Um, we offer custom development and manufacturing services, uh, including downstream processing services we offer for our customers. Um, we have our in-house capability of synthesizing our small molecule of affinity ligands and our large-scale manufacturing uh, up to the scale of 1,000 liter per batch. Um, our quality system is to GMP standard. We manufacture in clean rooms and we offer extensive quality support, including regulatory filings for our customers. Uh, as of now, there are over 21 Astra-absorbent products that are used in FDA, EMA license products in the hands of our customers. Um, our applications are well established in terms of what we offer, a modular program of discover, develop, and deliver um, at large scale, uh, able to support our customers commercially. Um, Astra Bioseparation, in essence, is, is the only bioseparation company to offer ligand discovery and absorbent development services in combination with large-scale manufacture of chromatography absorbent and also supply of prepacked GMP ready columns. We have a global presence. Um, we have we have a, our main manufacturing site in the Isle of Man, British Isles, an R&D site in Cambridge, a manufacturing site in Canada, uh, a laboratory and warehouse and offices in, in the US and we just opened the new outpost in Singapore to serve the APAC region. Our sister company, Nanoparel, also located in the US in South Dakota and we have numerous distributors around the globe. With regards to product offering, our products are used for predominantly purification and polishing applications. We offer products with excellent performance for purification of target proteins, antibodies, viral vectors, whether you're talking about albumin or insulin or glycoprotein. Our product offers excellent performance. We also have products for various polishing steps. Uh, one of our products, uh, Toxiclair, um, a very good performance with the tox endotoxin clearance. And we have products for isoglutamine and prion removals as well. Like I said earlier, we, we offer products in prepacked GMP ready columns, ready for plug and play in our customer's hands. Um, and we also offer our SNAP columns, which is predominantly uh, for research purposes. Um, various column diameters and bed heights available for empty column orders and for column packing services. In terms of manufacturing capability uh, to help us maintain control and ensure timely product delivery, we retain the in-house capability for our whole manufacturing value chain. We have the in-house capability of manufacturing our own affinity ligands. We have the in-house capability of making our own base matrix, which is the pyramid. And we've had over 30 years experience in the attachment chemistry, the derivatization process for making the final affinity chromatographic uh, products at a very large scale um, from from a, a small scale of one liter up to a thousand liter by scale. 
talking a bit more about the uh, pure bit base matrix um we have a, a special property which is the uniform bit with near monodispersed particle size offering excellent porosity and flow properties as so you can see in the slide to the right, the comparison of our base matrix pyrubit against market leading product with pyrubit clearly showing a superior performance in terms of porosity and pressure drop versus flow. We have over two decades of bead manufacturing experience and our beads are currently manufactured across two of our sites, um, our sites in Canada and currently our site in, in the Isle of Man undergoing qualification. Uh, this, this manufacturing uh, security across two sides ensure minimal or no disruption to product delivery. And we're also proud to say that our base matrix manufacturing process is as green as it can get with regards to the environment, with no solvent directly involved in the process of the manufacturing. We are created to ISO 9001, and we operate against the quality system designed to offer GMP-ready products and comprehensive regulatory support for our customers' files. Our derivative process, which is the final product uh, that we sell to customers, uh, all the processes, all the steps in that is completed in a clearroom environment um, at ISO 7, ISO 8, depending on specific requirements. And as mentioned earlier, uh, by scale is anywhere from a, a liter scale to a thousand liter. We have inside uh, reactors ranging from three liters to two and a half thousand liters. And our production capacity is in excess of 35,000 per liter, uh, 35,000 liters per, per annum. Um, this, this volume can easily be dialed up or down in terms of our flexibility to ramp up capacity with changes to shift and other flexibility we have in our system. Um, our plant services on site to ensure security of supply, we have dual systems for most of our plant services. We have a, a big a big warehouse with temperature mapped. We have an on-site effluent treatment plant and we have extensive QC and QA capabilities on site to support our manufacturing and supply of products. We also offer prepare columns. Um, our prepare columns offering is of two folds. Um, the snap columns predominantly uh, shipped out from our US site. Um, we offer empty columns and we offer uh, column packing service of various uh, column diameters and bed heights um, with very short lead time for packing. We have the capacity and capability to pack hundreds of columns of different resin products uh, uh, per year in our US site. And um, for the evolved columns, which is predominantly completed in the Isle of Man site, we have a capacity to pack hundreds of these uh, columns on site per annum, um, and we are increasing that capacity. We we have extensive knowledge in, in column packing, and we have been able to qualify and validate packing services for different readings for various customers over the years. A column evolved column packing is completed in ISO 7 environment, um, which supports our our regulatory with respect to GMP uh, ready prepared columns. Um, I have covered uh, manufacturing capacity, summarizing our ability and preparedness to deliver authentic chromatography products at large scale. However, there are external factors that must be factored in when it comes to product delivery. Um, I would like to discuss these factors under the broad heading of supply chain and the challenges around supply chains. Um, obviously, with with, uh, with our main manufacturing side base in the UK, um, we had some little disruptions as regards to Brexit, but then we had the COVID-19 pandemic. And, and this have all been a source of challenge in terms of the impact on supply chains and the disruptions that comes with that. Um, there's been uh, traditionally what we used to rely on in terms of supply chain planning and reliability 
is is almost been outdated because the amount of unpredictability around everything to do with the value chain and manufacturing is is so much in, in the current pandemic era. Um, how that's impacting us and how and what we are doing uh, in terms of mitigating this impact to ensure that we still delivering product to customer is some of the things I would like to go through in the next few slides. When we talk about supply chain resilience, um, in the past it was more about supply chain reliability. How can we rely on our supply chain? Um, traditional approaches like dual supplies for your materials or shipping channels or distribution centers, uh, those are still valid, but those are not, not good enough in this pandemic and post-pandemic era. There needs to be a, a shift in, in the approach that we take to help us to continue to, to guarantee product supply to, to the customers. And one of the ways we look at it is about uh, visibility and agility. And, and those two things combined is what gives us the resilience that we need to be able to continue to operate in, in this current uh, post-pandemic or even pandemic uh, uh, situation. In terms of visibility, we're talking about the ability to to see disruptions way ahead of time, as early as you can detect it, to be able to react quicker uh, to 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 minimize the impact that might come from that. And um, but in terms of reacting, you need to be prepared to 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 have the redundancy in your capacity to be able to react. And for us, visibility and, and what we're doing about that in this period of uncertainty is, is increasing and improving our communication and communication in both ways to the customers, to suppliers, to our vendors, to our distributors and, and all around and kind of modifying our demand supply planning. And then most importantly, uh, data. Um, data is, is very important in terms of data analytics and understanding what the past is. That doesn't necessarily tell you what the future will be, but gives you an indication of how you can plan better. In terms of agility, uh, we're ensuring we have capacity redundancy to be able to react to short-term unforeseen changes. Um, we are optimizing for efficiency, not just optimizing for cost reduction and how that translates into us being prepared to be able to move quickly when the change in demand comes in or where that delay in the shipment of raw material or a cancellation by customer or a cancellation by supplier how are we ready to to mitigate the impact of those and when you combine this together when you combine and improve visibility of the problem and the agility and the preparedness to be able to to incorporate unforeseen and short-term changes that will offer what we term as supply chain resilience. What I'd like to do quickly is to go through a mini case study of one of the supply chain disruption that we had a few months ago uh, on the Altman site. Um, we had a supplier who reached out to us uh, unable to meet a great delivery for raw material. Um, they were going to uh, lockdown in their region and, and their size was not able to keep up with the supply. No fault of this and then go back to what I said about uncertainties um, in, in this pandemic era. This is something that we'll have to deal with over the past 18 months. Um, the supply cannot confirm, the supply couldn't confirm when they will be able to, to meet the delivery. Uh, and for this particular case study, uh, again, if you go back to what I said about traditional uh, supply chain reliability not be enough, you would expect, okay, let's go to a second supplier. Um, but even in this case, the second supplier wasn't able to meet up. So we were faced with with various impacts of, of this uh, this situation, impact on the manufacturing plant, uh, impact on our capacity utilization, and the impact of having to potentially disappoint the customer because if we couldn't get the raw material, uh, which means we couldn't, we won't be able to, to manufacture and deliver the product. I mean, in this particular case study, our desired resolution, what, what we wanted to solve was to 
find ways that we could minimize those highlighted impacts. So we need to find a new supplier that's suitable and can give us comparable material. And we need to assess and qualify the supplier and qualify the material and get it there in time for us to manufacture the product and deliver to the customer in time as agreed. Um, the timeline for this case study was about 10 weeks. So by the time the supplier came to us, we were roughly 10 weeks away from scheduled manufacture. So we had 10 weeks to resolve it. And a few slides ago, I talked about visibility and agility and how that is combining to give us our supply chain resilience. In this particular case study, we were able to see, uh, even though 10 weeks is a short space of time, but that gave us enough time for us to be able to react. Um, we kept the communication open to the supplier and they were able to tell us in the instant that they knew that they couldn't make the delivery. Um, and again, in terms of communication, we were able to tell our customers what the situation was and what we we're doing about it at the time. With regards to the agility, um, we wouldn't have to think about how to qualify our customers because we already had established quality systems uh, uh, on how to do that. That made the, the whole approach and the whole actions around that easier. Um, we we had a system in place on how we bring in new supplier and new materials while maintaining the same quality standard. We also have enough redundancy within our capacity to be able to take in this unplanned work. Um, 10 weeks to delivery, no one really planned this, um, but we had, uh, we had ways to be able to make our shift work flexible to be able to get more out of our site and our equipment and our people. Um, we, we have a, a system where we cross training across different departments or even sections within the same department for us to be able to move people around depending on where the demand or where the plan work is arising. All this flexibility is what offers us the agility to be able to keep up in situations like this. And talking about our rich success supply chain management, um, we we do have a robust core system in place that allows us to not only quickly change suppliers and materials while maintaining the same quality, but also making sure that we keep in everyone in the loop in terms of the stakeholders and the communication around that, so everyone is aware of our approaches, of our actions, and how we pursue in this. The first step towards our change of a supply and material management is sourcing and qualification. This is where we, we look out for suppliers um, that are available out there. Normally we'll start from our pre-approved suppliers um, and kind of make it easier for us to implement the change. And then we look at the material specification assessment and the material criticality assessment. And depending on how critical or non-critical the material is, that will depend on the extensive nature of work that will be required to qualify the supplier and the material. And then we perform the quality impact review and notification. And, and, and this process was, was established even before the pandemic era. But the modification to this is unlike what you see on the screen where we notify at stage two, we are notifying the customer from day one just to improve our communication and to make sure that that visibility is there, not just with us, but with our suppliers and our customers as well. And moving on to my last slide, which is how what are we doing to improve further our supply chain resilience? Um, we are investing in data restriction. Um, our supply, our demand and supply planning, our S and, S and our sales and operations process. Um, we are investing a lot in data analytics that will help us be able to transmit and be able able to see what the changes are and receive the communication from the customers and the suppliers in such a way that it makes our visibility way more improved than what it is right now. 
we are established closer we are establishing a closer relationship and interaction with our customers and, and suppliers just to make sure that everyone is in the loop with any changes either from the supplier from our end or from the customer's end in terms of our agility um we are moving to what we want to term safety stock um but that is working in close partnership with our customers to understand their demands and be able to have a buffer of stock of raw materials or even products for us to be able to meet the demand in time as they wanted and um, this is something that uh, the commercial team is, is working closely with our customers to help us uh, put in place uh, in terms of adaptability we are increasing our, our employee skills and retooling and making sure we improve in flexibility across sites in such a way that we can ramp up or ramp down capacity wherever the demand is within different sections of the company. And we are also expanding our presence. I talked about our new outpost in Singapore that will be expanding over the next few months. Um, and we also will be expanding some of our, our shipping locations of different products. I talked about the snap columns that will be coming to the Isle of Man for packing and shipping from here. Uh, to serve the European market um, and there are other things that we're doing to improve our way of serving the customer uh, with regards to product delivery. I think that's everything for me. Uh, the, the last slide has got contact information if you want to reach out to us. Um, I'll hand over to, to Leah to, to take the next step. Okay, great. So we have some questions. Um, the first question is, what is the shelf life of Astrea Absorbent? Uh, Astrea Absorbent is uh, typically uh, three to five years shelf life. Um, we, we have uh, stability studies on all our products and, and as we get the results, there will be some changes, but typically it's three to five years for most of our products. And do you always have spare capacity, or is it is this dependent on the number of batches running or scale of batches at any one time? Um, we we always have room for taking on more. We we always have spare capacity. We don't run at 100%. Um, we we run about 75% effective, which uh, gives us room to be able to take on more uh, and be able to satisfy our customers. Okay, well, it looks like we're running out of time for questions. Um, if we haven't answered your question, we'll be passing it on to Ari and he can get back with you directly. But please go ahead and continue to type your questions in. The last question we have for the webcast is, how long does it take to find and qualify a new supplier? Uh, that's a good question. Um, it depends, I would say, uh, between one week to eight, to 10 weeks depends on the criticality of the raw material um if it's a non-critical raw material it could be a matter of a week or two if if it's a, a critical raw material where we need to do extensive testing uh, trial batches um uh, kind of liaising and partner with the customer to make sure that they're happy with the change um that could take up to up eight to ten weeks um depending on the agreement in terms of QT we have with various customers. So uh, generally anywhere between one to 10 weeks for a raw material change. Okay, well, thank you, Ari, and thanks to our audience for joining us. The recorded version of this webcast will be available for on-demand viewing on our website and as a registered attendee, you will receive a follow-up email providing you with a direct link. We look forward to having you join us at future Bioprocess International Ask the Expert webcasts. Look for those announcements in your inbox. Goodbye.